Hello, welcome to the Friday Waffle. It's quite late actually. Um, I've just been doing different bits and pieces. Um, as you can tell, I'm in the kitchen. My wife's going to bed, so I was kicked out of my games room. So I thought I'd just come downstairs and do this. Um, I'm uh, recording this on 60 frames a second and also on a higher resolution. Now, I don't know if that's uh, I don't know how it's going to work out, um, so we'll give it a go. I've got 40 minutes I can record, so it's going to be slightly shorter than the, than the waffles have been recently, but I just want to kind of experiment and see if I can get a kind of decent sort of video quality. So anyway, I hope you're all well. I am not going to yawn and I'm not going to rub my face and I'm not going to go about my work, because I do it every single week. So I'm just going to batter straight in. Um, eBay. Now, I've been having a few rants uh, about eBay for different things. I mean, we all know that eBay is an evil corporate uh, business now. It's no longer the, you know, the wonderful thing that it once was, um, you know, back in the early, you know, maybe 10, 20 years ago. But uh, I had a really, really good experience on eBay this week, actually. I bought a... It's a, a laser for a replacement laser for my PC Engine Duo, which is like the CD based uh, system. I bought a replacement laser and uh, hopefully it was going to fix the fault because I mean the, the lasers in these things are notoriously uh, unreliable. I mean these things are 20 years old, they're not designed to be played 20 years later. Anyway, uh, I bought this replacement laser, it cost me 36 quid. And I swapped it over and the fault still persisted. So I contacted the, the seller just to, to let him know. I, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd asked him, I'd, when, I, when I was buying it, I told him what the problem was with my thing. And I, he says, well, yeah, the, the laser is quite a, you know, it's a part, it's a common fault. So I went back to him and I said, oh, just to let you know, the laser, the replacement laser didn't work. Uh, he wouldn't happen to know what it could possibly be. I wasn't asking him to take it back, I was just merely telling him how I got on and asking uh, if he could you know, maybe give me any tips and he says to me look just send it back and I'm like what? He says yeah, he says, if, if, you, if you can't use it send it back to me. So anyway, um, a friend of mine's, uh, you'll, you'll soon find out, um, <laughs> a friend of mine's who's rather good at fixing stuff um, very very kindly agreed to uh, have a look at this thing. So I sent it away to get it fixed, uh, I mean it's still away at the moment, and uh, I sent the replacement laser and I contacted the, the eBay or the seller on eBay and I says look, I says can I hang on, can I hang on to the laser, I says what I'll do is I'll pay for it again um, because it, it's, it is still possible that I might need the laser and he basically said to me, he says look, I mean he refunded my money, I got my money back right away, he says look Hang on to it, see how you go on with it. If you need it, you can pay me for it. If not, send it back. Um, so as it turns out, I do need the laser. Um, there was a few more issues with my laser than I, I first thought. But I just thought, what an absolutely amazing seller. You know, they, they didn't only refund me for something that I'd bought off them. They let me basically keep it until I had decided whether I was wanting to keep it or not and then pay them. So uh, I know that this guy won't be watching my channel, so I'm not going to thank him uh, online. But I just think it's uh, yeah. There's a lot of you know there's a lot of wankers in eBay, um, but it's really really nice when you do get somebody just as genuine as him. So yeah, thank you very much. Uh, price of PCs. Um, <clears throat> I've been dabbling. That's probably the best word to use um, with my PSVR trying to use it on the PC and you know, apparently you can use it, there's a piece of software which you can uh, buy, it's not very expensive. So I tried it last week, uh, I yeah, unplugged the PSVR and had it plugged into my PC, I mean there was cables everywhere, I wasn't, I wasn't uh, particularly happy about unplugging it because my games room, I say, it's a tiny tiny little room, I've got cables and stuff everywhere, it's a, t it's a tidy room. But the back of the TV, there are just a million cables. Anyway, to get back, get back on track. Um, I had the, the PSVR plugged into the PC, but this, I was having very, very limited success. So 
It was uh, Neil Morris, one of my uh, one of my uh, viewers. <laughs> I'll call you that, Neil. Um, <clears throat> he he was going about. He says, "Oh, he's got a he's got an Oculus Rift, I think it is." And he says, "Oh, it's amazing." He says, "You need to try this uh, virtual arcade." So thanks to Neil, I went onto YouTube and I did uh, a search on this arcade, and I'm like, "Wow." That just looks amazing. Um, you're basically in, in this 1980s arcade. You know, you're in there, you've got the, the carpet, the, everything, the music, different cabs, bowling alley. It just looks absolutely incredible. Um, and I'm like, I would really, really like that. So I had a look on eBay and Gumtree um, to see how much Oculus Rift rifts we're going for and you can get is it the dev kit one for like 40 quid and there was somebody selling a dev kit two for like 60. so i asked one of my mates who knows all about oculus rifts and he says he says don't waste your money with the first one he says it won't even work he says that they don't support they don't support it he says the second one he says the support isn't really there anymore. He says you will get it to work, but not particularly well. He says you're better off getting the, the full one. Now I know the full one's about, I don't know, 350 quid, something like that. But I posted on my forum asking, uh, I put the specs on my computer and I said, uh, I know I'm probably, it's like a, a shot in the dark here and I'm probably talking a th utter nonsense, I says, but would I be able to run Oculus Rift using my current PC? Because I'd, I'd done, there's a website, um, I put my details in and it says, yes, your PC is more than capable, it meets like, the minimum requirement. But uh, a few guys got back to me on the forum and they says, don't even waste your time. It says, you know, it's nowhere near powerful enough. So I says, you know, fig figuratively speaking, were I to buy a graphics card that was going to give me a good experience in VR, how much would it cost? And they said they're talking about five hundred and fifty pounds for a graphics card. So no, I won't be getting an Oculus Rift anytime soon. <laughs> uh, if any of you guys have got a, a VR running on uh, a not very powerful computer, let me know. But I think I might have to uh, try and go back to the PSVR thing, see if I can get it going again. If anybody's watching this video and has successfully got the PSVR working. With the PC, let me know. And I did, there's an instructional video which, to be fair, was pretty good, but I was just struggling with it, struggling big time. Uh, so, yeah, it just 550 pounds for a graphics card. I mean, I remember, I remember what, what would it be, maybe 20 years ago, maybe not even as much as that. Your entire PC, your top of the range entire PC was 500 pounds now. People are paying £500 just for a graphics card. Yeah, they're going about, you know, the the, uh, the PC brigade going about how wonderful it is and how, how it's, you know, the, the, the PS4 is like 10 year old technology and blah, 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 blah. But seriously, I could, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night if I uh, spent 550 quid on a graphics card. I just simply wouldn't uh, be able to sleep at all. Um, so no, I mean I, I was I was surprised at just how expensive PCs have become. Yeah, they're super powerful, a lot more you know more powerful than ever were twenty years ago. But that's a lot of money. So I wouldn't be getting a a, a PC to run Oculus Rift for a long, long time, if at all, unless they come down in price a lot. But like I says, if any of you guys are running a Oculus Rift on a not very powerful computer. Let me know. I mean, I don't even. What's my graphics card? Is it a GeForce Seven Fifty Ti? Is that something? Is that a graphics card? I think it may be Seven Fifty Ti, something like that. I mean, it's it runs games, you know, nine twenty by ten eighty. Um, but I'm guessing it's a it's a budget card. But if anybody's running successfully, running a a VR using a similar setup to what I've got. I mean, I've got a, an i7 3.6 gigahertz. Uh, I've got 16 gig of RAM. Uh, like I say, my graphics card is a 750 Ti, I think it is. 
if anybody's running that with that setup, let me know. I mean, I'm really not, I'm really not fussed about. Well, I was going to see having super high resolution, but then it's not the, the computer does that; it's the actual headset. So anyway, let me know. But yeah, I won't be getting uh, Oculus Rift anytime soon. Monetize the channel. Um, if you've been watching my videos the last week or so, you, you'll uh, you'll realise that uh, last week I decided to monetize the channel. Now, I know, I know, I know, I know. I've I've always been, I've always drummed on about how I will never monetize the channel, <coughs> and you know, I, I don't quite know why I was so adamant I was never going to monetize the channel. I think. Part of it was, yeah, it's a hobby, and no, I don't want adverts on my videos and that kind of stuff. But then when I was down in the Blackpool, I was talking to a few guys. I was talking to my mate, uh, Novabug, and I was asking him about it. He's, he's been monetizing his videos for quite a while. And I just, as I was coming back up the road, I just thought to myself, why am I not doing this? I mean, I think everybody that watches my channel, and not just my channel, any channel, I think you guys appreciate the work that goes in to you know keeping a, a YouTube channel going. There is a lot of work. I don't mean to admit that. I mean it does take a lot of when you say hard work, but it does take a lot of commitment and time. That's a big factor. You've got to give up a lot of time to do it. And that's my choice. You know, I don't expect uh, anybody to say thank you very much for doing that because that's my choice. And I don't I don't when I say I don't get anything back, I don't make any money, I don't get anything back, sort of tangible for, for doing that. Don't get me wrong, you know, having people uh, having people just say and enjoy my videos, that is that is the best, that is the most amazing thing you could ever get with YouTube. I mean I had one person, I hope they don't mind me mentioning this, um, I'm not gonna name them, I can't actually remember the person's name, but they said they, they thanked me for uh, the channel and they said that they'd had that particularly shitty year and my channel, watch my YouTube channel, can you help to get them through it, through a kind of particularly tough time. And that just, uh, I, got, I felt quite emotional when I read that. I thought, wow, you know, that somebody's taking time to, to tell me that. And it's absolutely awesome to think that little old me talking, talking nonsense, eh, uh, could help, could have that kind of impact on somebody. So, whoever you were, again, thank you very much. I mean, I did thank you in the comments. Uh, that's just, that's, you know, awesome. But yeah, getting back to the money side of things, yeah, I don't make any money out of it. And I thought to myself, why don't I monetize the channel? I mean, I, I think I'm, I think I'm probably looking at about 10, 15 quid a month. It's absolutely peanuts, it's nothing. But you know what? If YouTube want to give me that money, then why not? I mean, you know, supposing I'm getting 10, 15 quid a month times a year, what's that? 10, 150. Say I'm getting about 200 quid a year. Yeah, excellent. It's 200 pounds, it's like free money. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll see how it goes. Uh, my channel is still under review. That's the, the term I like to use. Uh, it's still in. Pardon me about the hiccups, uh, it's still under review, in other words, I'm probably looking at every single one of my videos, so um, considering I've got something like 1100 videos, it could take a while. So I don't know what they do, they look at your channel, I think they make sure you're not some kind of bad, make sure you're not Logan Paul, anything like that. Um, yeah, so that's monetizing the channel, like I said, you know, thank you, I, thanks for the comments, I mean, I was asking you guys what you think about it, and one person, I can't remember who it was, they said, why are you asking? It's, it's nobody's business, it's your channel, it's your choice, it's really nothing to do with anybody. And yeah, you could say he's right, but I can pride myself on having quite an open, you know, it's an open forum. Um, I mean, when I go through, I always make a point of trying, trying to answer um, all the comments. And you lot talk amongst yourselves. I see the banter going between people. And it makes me kind of quite proud that, you know, I've kind of brought all you guys together. Um, I am conscious that some people who've maybe never watched the channel for the first time might 
look at that and you know I, I, I tend to kind of refer to you know if somebody asks me a question I'll always try and talk, you know call them by their first name if I know it and I, I'm aware that that could potentially uh, isolate people they might think oh this guy's got a bit of a clique kind of channel it's only people that know him but hopefully people that do watch the channel know that's not the case um, but yeah I just think it's amazing that you know I don't like to call it you know, subscribers, I suppose that's a, the technical term, that there's, there's, you guys are watching the channel, can you have the banner, you have the, have a carry on, you know, with each other as well, and I think that's brilliant, and um, that is really what keeps me doing this thing, so yeah, we'll see what happens, if I start wearing the expensive jewellery, and I suddenly, you know, appear in 4k camera, then you know that, uh, <laughs> I'm getting more than 15 quid a month, but, Anyway, right, um, I don't know, like I said, I've got 40 minutes on this thing, I've got no idea how much longer I've got, I've been talking for about 10 minutes, so I'm just going to crack on right away with the questions. Uh, Refraction PCX2, now, I didn't realise that, uh, well, this gentleman has been watching my channel for quite a while, I didn't realise that he's actually one of the sort of developers of the PC, the PC engine. He's one of the developers of the, uh, the PlayStation 2 emulator, so I am extremely impressed with that. That's amazing. A question based off one you had this waffle, which was last waffle. If you had the opportunity, would you like to go back to playing games with a joystick like you did in the old days? Thanks for that. <laughs> I know what you mean. Or do you think we have covered, so we are, we are cornered into using modern controllers or mouse or keyboards? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I love I love old systems, as you know. When I'm playing eight bit games, I use proper hardware. If I'm playing eight bit emulators, I've got a, a little device which allows me to plug in an Atari eight bit, uh, eight bit, is it eight pin, nine pin, nine pin joystick. So I'll always try and use where a, an original piece of hardware used a, a joystick then I'll always try and use it so if I'm playing like the, the Commodore Amiga, Atari ST, you know Amstrad, Spectrum, BBC, Commodore 64, any of these I'll always try and use a joystick. Would I want the joystick to be the controller of choice? I think for for movement I think the joystick takes a lot of beating yeah, especially arcade games but the big problem with the joystick was one button, and I, I certainly like, I mean, I, I am comfortable using, um, you know, like Xbox 360 controllers, the PS4 controller. Um, I'm not going to say, yeah, I wish we could go back to the joystick, but for certain games, for games that only require one button and they were originally joystick based, then I'll always go for the joystick. So, excellent question. Number two, would you rather play a version of a game for the PC Engine for example, which had the classic chip tune, chip tunes music, or the version released for the CD version of the console with proper CD audio. Now, what you're saying there is, yeah, I've uh, I've got the PC Engine Duo, which is a CD-based PC Engine, and I've also got the original CD F sharp. I've got the original PC Engine, which uh, obviously uses kind of chip tunes. What do I prefer? You know what, I don't think I prefer any, I mean, that's not to say that, I, I like them both. Um, I'm quite happy playing arcade games with chiptune music. However, saying that, I mean, I've, you know, before it broke, some of the games on the, the PC Engine, you know, with the CD, it's the same graphics, but they've got like, quite, you know, fancy uh, orchestral pieces. And that does add to the game, but you know, would I pick one over the other? Not really. I'm, I like them both. Um, I am probably old school. I do like. I'm not. I'm not a big fan of music and games anyway. Um, but I would quite happily, you know, play a game with an eight bit. But there are some games that I've played on the PC Engine Duo, and you know, stuff like uh, obviously your PlayStation, all your CD based systems, your Saturn, Dreamcast, all these. They've all got like real music, and yeah, it does add to the ambience of the game. Um, but as far as old school 8 bit chip tunes, I'm quite happy with that as well. So, anyway, listen, thanks very much for the question. 
Next up, Panther UK. <clears throat> For this week, how often do or have games given you the right hump? I've never broken anything in rage. I'm off the just turn it off school of thought. Games are basically going to smash the joystick. There's been a few games, um, probably kind of when I see up to date games, I'm talking about games that have come out in maybe the last 10 years. There's been a couple, one of them, the, the most recent game that I just got completely, 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 that's not even a word, uh, completely pissed off with, and it was a uh, Bioshock Infinite, is that what it's called? Infinity? Infinite? Infinity, I think it was called. And uh, yeah, it's a very, very, I don't want any, any spoilers, it's an ancient game now, any you've probably played it. The very, very last level, you're on a you're on this uh, balloon, balloon ship, what are they called? Big balloons, what are they called? Hot air balloons, whatever it is. And uh, <coughs> yeah, you're in this and you're getting attacked with all these baddies that are on other uh, balloon ships. <laughs> There's a name for it, I can't think. It's too late, I shouldn't, you know what, I was thinking, I shouldn't actually, the reason I always yawn and rub my eyes is because I'm absolutely that girl. It's Friday, I've been working all week. I should maybe have a Monday monologue, a Tuesday talk, a Wednesday waffle, obviously, a Thursday, I don't know, yeah, maybe it is, but that's why I rub my eyes, because it's Friday. But, uh, what was I talking about? Yeah, this particular game, you're getting bombarded with all these baddies, and you can play it for maybe 10, 15 minutes, and then you die and then you go right back to the very start again and I played it on and off for maybe a few months and I just got absolutely sick of it I thought I'm not going back to it again I could not go back to it because I've just tried and tried and tried and tried and I don't find that enjoyable you know it's fine if it maybe kills you and then it you know it only takes you back a couple of minutes to play but when it's taking you back like 10 minutes I'm like nah but I think that's probably the only game that I could think of um, that I've just completely flung my toys. I've actually got a video coming out next week, uh, kind of 10 of the hardest Commodore 64 games. In fact, it's not just Commodore 64 games, 10 of the hardest 8-bit and 16-bit games. Uh, I've got it recorded, so I'll be putting that out next week. But yeah, Bioshock Infinity, or Infinite, whatever it is, I can't remember. That's probably the one. I really remember. So anyway, thanks, uh, Chris. Next up, uh, Mr. Doug Scullery. The current controversy surrounding Twin Galaxies might end up bringing that whole thing down. It's obviously massively compromised with clear fake, sorry, clearly fake, unverified scores having like been accepted in the early years with very few questions asked. They need to start again from scratch with all scores having to be played at live, live at live events, not via the internet. This would have a huge effect re-energising the gaming scene and would overall be really beneficial. Um, your thoughts? I, I mean, I've, I've not been following it in any real detail, uh, Doug. I mean, I know, look, I know what Twin Galaxies is. I mean, you know, I'm mates with quite a few guys that have got big scores. My mate Tony Temple's got the Missile Command World High Score. Um, my mate Dave, who I met down at Blackpool last week. He is the he's the world record holder for Galaxian. John Studley, he's the, what's the perfect Pac-Man. And one of my mates who goes to the computer club, Ian Cullen, he has just recently taken, I think it's the eighth highest score on 1942 using Maine. So well done to him. And he's also done one, is it Top Drive? I noticed he put out another one. So he's now in Twin Galaxies as well. The thing that gets me, and maybe maybe I'm I'm being a bit naive, it's it's video games. It's a bit of fun. I mean, I'm sure there are people, there are some people, probably guys like Billy Mitchell and Todd Rogers. I'm sure there are some guys who do make a living out of. Well, maybe not make a living, but they've certainly made money out of uh, the whole Twin Galaxies thing. But my initial reaction was, who really cares? Oh, somebody cheated, whatever. It's not hurting anybody. But I know it is a massive thing. It's maybe, you know, 
people who have possibly submitted scores in the past uh, would probably be quite upset with the whole thing. But yeah, I, I, I tend to think because it's not, there's nobody making any money really that I'm aware of, I think they'd be, they would have been better just parking the classic scores and saying these are these are the, the scores from back in the day, these are now the modern scores and basically, you know, wipe the slate clean and start from scratch but you can still have these other scores as part of history. I mean, who's it, who's it hurting? I'm really not quite sure. I know, you know, Twin Galaxies and it is big business for a lot of people but uh, I just, I, I just think to myself, it's just a video game. Is it really harming anybody whether I make a score up or not? Um, it's obviously, you know, it's affected probably people in America a lot more because they're the guys that are really into, into their high scoring. But uh, I, it'd, be, it'd be disappointing <clears throat> if, if, it would, if it came out, if it was proven that these guys were cheating. The thing is, I don't think you can ever take anything away from these guys as far as they're all, even, I mean, guys like Todd Rogers, Billy Mitchell, they are amazing uh, players. When you see them playing arcade games, they're just incredible. So there's no disputing that these guys are shit hot at video games. Yeah, some of the scores that were submitted, you know, I think it's back in 1983 when these scores were getting submitted, they probably never thought anything of it. They probably, they, I don't think for one second they would have thought in 2018, what, in 35 years' time, um, people are going to be looking at our scores. They probably thought it was a bit of fun. Walter Day starting up Twin Galaxies. It was a way of documenting scores. Um, I find it hard to believe that these guys really imagined that the scores that they were putting out in these games is going to be, would be getting talked about. 35 years later, I don't know, but right. I've just uh, stopped the video and transferred the documents off, so I should have a little bit more than 45 minutes now, which is good. Right, where was I? Yeah, I've just answered Doug's first uh, bit of the question. Yeah, talking about live scores. Yeah, I think uh, Doug, like I said, the way I see it is, it's just it's just video games. Um, but I think in light of you know the cheating that's going on. I think, as you say, I think they've got to, they've got to archive it and see, right, that was the, the vintage years. This is, oh, that's my Alexa. Alexa, stop. That's my Alexa app telling me to, uh, that 40 minutes was up. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think we should start afresh with modern technology. I think that's the best way to really do that. Secondly, from Doug, <clears throat> What do you feel is gaming's greatest ever ripoff? Could it be microtransactions, EA's annual updates of their numerous franchises, EA itself, mid-generation console updates that don't offer anything particularly great over existing models, or could it be US gold flogging aged dire software <laughs> from Arctic and calling it World Cup Carnival, or could it be something I haven't considered at all? Mr. Stewart, it's over to you. Ah, uh, there's a lot, a lot there. Uh, yeah, World Cup Carnival. I can still remember. I remember seeing adverts for it. Um, what would it be? Nineteen eighty six. I think it was nineteen eighty six World Cup. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, you got a T-shirt. I think you got a badge. Basically, they packed this box with as much tat as it could possibly fit in. And the only thing they forgot to do is actually put a good game in. So they used like a five-year-old football game which as Doug was saying was released by a company called Arctic and it was awful, absolutely woeful. I don't think we could say that was the biggest rip off, um, I mean I think it was maybe £10, you still got a t-shirt so hey ho. But yeah I think uh, <clears throat> nowadays my pet hate, and I will be talking about it in a wee while, my pet hate is having to purchase additional things in games. You know, I'm I'm old school. When I bought a game, I expect to own the game and to have access to everything in the game. I don't expect to have to fork out more money to unlock things. Now, I don't have a problem at all 
with like buying like downloadable content if you're getting extra levels. I mean, one of my favourite sort of current chain games is The Last of Us. I've played it twice. I completed it on the PS3, completed it on the PS4, and I downloaded. There was a, another episode which I downloaded, and I'm quite happy to pay for that. You know, you're getting more. You're getting more game. But where I think it is a rip off is it's not even so much a rip off, but well, it is a rip off. Is where they're targeting children with you know unlocking extras. You know, you pay five pounds and you'll get a, a new skin for your character, or you'll get a, an extra sword, or you'll get an extra a, you know uniform, not uniform costume, whatever. You know, um, but that is just something that we'll just, I think we're going to have to live with now. Um, <clears throat> I mean, there's, there's been games that have come out even a few years ago where, I mean, one of the, one of the biggest ones, I was going to say that you get, you buy a game on a disc and extra levels are already on the disc but you've got to pay to unlock them. Now, some people are arguing and saying, well, I own the disc, so why should I be paying to unlock something that I've already bought? <sighs> you know, I mean, one of the biggest, I suppose, yeah, you could call it rip-offs, are these games that require uh, you to basically purchase a plastic character to unlock a level or a character, uh, namely Skylanders and, is it Disney Infinity? And you, you could see it's similar to like, uh, I mean, Nintendo are doing it now with their Amiibos. You've got to buy a plastic character which you then sit on top of your 3DS and it unlocks extra things. But the Skylanders, I mean, that's a, that's one quite close to my heart because my daughter, it came out and my daughter thought this was the most amazing thing. And to be fair, the Skylanders game itself was actually really good. I used to play, you could play two players like simultaneous. I used to sit and play it with her, but then you would get to a bit in a level where it'd be like I don't know the I you know there'd be like a gate and it'd be like the gate to the ice world, and the only way you could get that you couldn't unlock it by playing harder or playing better or putting hours in, you had to physically buy like the ice character. <laughs> so you know they were they were practically waving the game in a kid's face saying nah, 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 nah. if you want to get to this next level you're going to have to ask your mum and dad to fork out 14 and go and buy it and like all these things some of them were a, an extremely short supply and it meant that you had to go on eBay and pay you know, twice the value of what these things were costing and you know I'm a fool but I went along with it and yeah we bought the characters and I mean it's it's kind of the way I looked at it was the actual characters that you were getting were actually pretty good they were really well made it's the same with the Disney Infinity they're really really well put together um, you could probably say that you know push game and shove you could probably say that they were worth it just for the model that you could put on a shelf the only thing is my daughter wasn't interested like them for the shelf so she would buy well she would ask for uh, a Skylander and we would buy it and we'd complete the level and that was it yeah you could you could then reuse the character you could play as that character for the rest of the game but yeah that is a it's a clever bit of programming I mean the amount of money that these guys must have made I don't even want to think about it I mean I don't know how many characters my daughter had Skylander wise Maybe 20, maybe, nah, maybe not quite as many as 20, easily 10, maybe 15 times, I think there would be a 10 at each, so there's about 100 quid, 150 quid extra, whereas if you bought the game and it was just all there, you would you would pay 40 quid for the game, but because of this, you were paying 190 quid for the game. So yeah, I don't like the way that has gone, but I think, I think we're going to have to get used to it. I mean, there's nobody to make you buy it. I mean, the thing that one of the things that I just find incredible are these apps, games, Android games. I mean, Android. I love my Android phone, 
but the thing that annoys me is every it seems impossible to buy a game you've got to you, you've got to just get the, the free one and then you've got all these adverts or you can unlock it or download coins I mean some of these apps is it Clash of Clash of Clans all these ones um, <clears throat> you basically had to you know you could buy like in-game currency for like you know a thousand coins for ten pounds five thousand for twenty pounds and there was ones like two million coins for a hundred pounds who in their right mind would spend a hundred pounds on virtual currency <laughs> I just don't get it I just think it's insane but as we'll find out shortly um, my daughter plays a game which is probably one of the biggest offenders when it comes to microtransactions but we'll talk about that later on so anyway listen Doug thanks thanks for the question <clears throat> excuse me a wee second right next up I've got wee Bob question for next week's waffle I know you love the Commodore 64 but which console computer handheld to you do you think looks the best physically give me your top three for me it would be the Mega Drive due to nostalgia. Number two, the Master System eh, because it reminds me of Knight Rider. <laughs> I know what you mean, the lights. Or from Tron with its angular features. Tough call eh, between the PS3 and the PSP is number one. I did talk about that a while ago. And if I remember rightly, I think I think probably the sexiest looking bit of hardware has got to be your number three, which is the Sega Mega Drive. Now I'm not talking about the Mega Drive two, I'm talking about the original Mega Drive. It just it, it looks really nice, it's minimalistic. Um it's minimalistic but it looks like the future. It's just and it's sleek, it's very, you know, it's not got it's not got much to look at. But you know it's it's black, it's shiny, it's got if I remember really it's just got the little you know is it kind of silver writing Mega Drive I can't remember actually I'm trying to do this from memory it's it just looks it looks amazing I think the Mega Drive Sega Mega Drive original would probably be my favourite looking console. Hey, what would be number two? Certainly not the Jaguar, certainly not the GX4000, it wouldn't be the SNES, it wouldn't be the NES. You know what, I think the original PlayStation, again, it's just that minimalistic grey slab. It's like, <laughs> it's like if Ikea made a console, it would be the PlayStation. It's like something that you could sit in your living room and it doesn't look out of place, it blends in well with the furniture. But yeah, I think I think the original PlayStation just looks nice. Again, it's minimalistic sort of features on it. Uh, yeah, that would be my second one. And another one, what could it be? Um, it wouldn't be any computers, <clears throat> excuse me. Probably agree with you actually, the, the PSP is a lovely looking machine, it really is, even now, I mean I've, uh, again if you've been watching my channel recently, I've just recently uh, rediscovered the, uh, the PSP, I've, I've, I went a bit daft, I've got a couple, I've got the PSP, is it 1001, which was the original one, which looks the nicest, it's heavy, it looks expensive. Um, and it, it's wonderful, it's a lovely bit of uh, kit and I've also got the 2000, or no, the 3001 model I think it is so yeah I think the, play, the PSP PlayStation would be second and would go for the Sega Mega Drive in first place so anyway Bob, thanks again right and lastly, I think it's lastly um, I'm going to break this into two parts Kevin down the rabbit hole now the reason I'm splitting it into two parts is because Kevin has asked me some questions about Overwatch. Now I don't play Overwatch. 
My daughter Ava is a massive Overwatch fan. She's been playing it for about the last two years. So I'm going to, uh, but I'm aware uh, Ava <laughs> very kindly answered your questions. She typed all that out herself. Not one, but two pages of answers. Now, Overwatch isn't something that I'm into at all. Excuse me. And it's not something that most people that watch this channel are going to be interested in. So what I'm going to do, Kev, I'm going to put your answers, Eva's answers, uh, right at the back end of this video. So yeah, you can jump to that if you want to watch it. But anyway, he's also asked me some questions for myself. So number one, what are some good classic arcade games that were ported to the original Game Boy? Eh? Ah ha ha ha! The original Game Boy. Um, still a nice, a nice console. I realise it's heavy, it looks the part. But I'm going to show you this in a second because there's a question, part three. Arcade ports. One of my favourite arcade ports on the Game Boy uh, is Double Dragon. It is really good. It's probably my favourite uh, home port of the game. It just looks and plays so well. And even playing it like through a Raspberry Pi or playing it through my uh, my Nvidia Shield, considering how small the screen is when you expand that onto a TV size, it still looks good. Yeah, it's black and white, but it plays so well. Double Dragon, another game which I like, which was really good, was uh, Nemesis. If I remember rightly, the port of that is pretty damned excellent. I think else, it's got a good Space Invaders. I didn't have my Game Boy for that long. As I keep saying, you know, back in the day when you wanted to get a new console or computer, you had to sell the one you had. It just simply wasn't possible to hang on to the one, you know, whatever you've got, because you didn't have the money, so the only way to fund a new system was to sell the one you had. And unfortunately, I can still, I can still actually to this day remember the guy coming to buy my Game Boy. I had it set up in a, it was like any cloakroom thing where you hung your jackets and I had all the games laid out in their cardboard boxes. I don't, I don't think I got very much money for it. But yeah, Double Dragon, Nemesis, Space Invaders, they always did Chase HQ. There's, there's, there's quite a few other versions of games, but I can't think offhand. I think there was a, was a side pocket as well, which is a pool game, which I think was pretty good. So, yeah, another Game Boy question is, are there any licensed games for it that are not platformers? <laughs> well, Double Dragon. Um, yeah, it seems like everything from Tasmania to the Blues Brothers are just platformers. I think the problem with the Game Boy Care is the hardware simply wasn't po it wasn't really powerful enough for like three D games. Though saying that, I think John Ritman was a monster, monster munch or something, monster madness, something like that. I think there was a monster mash, monster max. I can't remember. There was a a three D a kind of night glory type game for it. Um, but yeah, the, the Game Boy didn't really have the hardware for like scrolling games as such. So I think the platform game was always going to be the most popular. Uh, but like I've seen the talk about the actually saying there, is there any licensed games that were not platformers? I uh, well yeah Double Dragon that wasn't a platformer. Or that was that a conversion of an arcade? Yeah I mean there was Batman which is a platformer. Um, I'm sure there probably was, Kev. Like I said, I've not got. A, I'm not. I haven't got a particularly good knowledge of games in the when the Game Boy. Despite owning a one of these little EverDrive cartridges for it, got every game in it that is brilliant. And finally, and a final Game Boy question for you: Ben from T Rex Space Station modded his Game Boy to have a backlit screen. Yeah, I prefer playing on a Game Boy Advance that already has a backlit screen. Which do you think is better? Hey, well, here we go. One of my friends, Joe, his hobby is actually making uh, modded Game Boys. You can hopefully see there. But let me get, let me put, uh, let me just run Double Dragon. Oh, if I just, oh, 
I can't say, I'm just uh, starting the game. Let's see what's in this. Game Boy, right, let's go Dunk Rope. Let's have a button. What have we got here? Centipede. Tons cool spot. Yeah, cool spot. That was quite a good game. That was like uh, Othello. There was a platform cool spot, but there was also a game which was uh, Othello. Daffy Duck, Dark Man. There's so many games. Cutthroat Island. I think that was absolute pants. And Donkey Kong Land. Double Dragon. Here we go. I'm just trying to see. Uh, But uh, yeah, this is excellent. I mean, it makes... Oh, I've just started Chase HQ. Not to worry. It makes... Uh... Has it got speech? Mrs. Nancy at Chase HQ headquarters. <laughs> Chase HQ, yes. That's actually not too bad. Anyway, I shouldn't be playing that. But yeah, the backlit screen that is really good. But my uh, system of choice for playing Game Boy games is this. It's the original Game Boy Advance. And again, my mate Joe, who modded that for me, very, very kindly fitted. You've seen that if you well, if you've watched a single video of mine, you'll have seen that in the intro. Let me just switch it on. And it's underneath. Cracking screen, it really is. It's just uh, easy link. Let's just start any game. Activision. It's almost run out of batteries, but yeah, it looks absolutely glorious. I think the screen that's in this is the same as the clamshell Game Boy Advance, which was the. Uh, It was the same as the yeah the, the Game Boy Clam Game Boy Advance clamshell, the one that got released in the UK front lit, whereas the one that came out uh, in the States was the backlit one, and it had the better screen, and that's what this is actually running. So that is excellent. But I like the form factor of this. I just think form factor wise, this is so comfortable to make. So yeah. Right, anyway, listen, Kev, thank you very much. I think that is the last uh, question for me. So, anyway, right, listen, guys, what I'm going to do, um, I was actually, I was I was fanning about with my camera earlier on. I might do a live waffle in the next couple of weeks. I'll give it a go. Um, yeah, I think that is it. So, anyway, listen, thank you very much to watch. If you want to listen to me uh, answering a... Uh, Caves Overwatch questions, then stick with me. If not, thank you very much for watching. Right, Cave is asking if I can find the questions that he's asking. Now I did I've got to say Kev, I did ask Eva if she wanted to appear on camera um, as a sort of special guest, but she sadly declined, preferring to just uh, type. I mean she spent about an hour typing these questions out. I think she was uh, she was quite uh, she was quite made up the fact that you'd actually asked me to ask her for some questions. Where's the questions about? Uh, yeah, here we go, sorry. Right, Kev is asking. For the Friday Waffle, hi Alan. Last week you mentioned your daughter Ava is an into Overwatch and I'm tempted to start playing that title. But I have a question, question, questions perhaps only Ava can answer. Number one, is Diva a good character to play? I was thinking of starting with her. And I'll just read out what Ava's saying here. Number one, I personally think D.Va is a great character to play and even better to start off with. I myself play D.Va eh, the most out of all the heroes, having over 120 hours on her. D.Va is a tank, meaning she's ideal for attack and defence, depending on your preferred playstyle. She's great for holding objectives and picking off enemy players as well as soaking up the damage and protecting allies. D.Va can work great in most scenarios and she's very powerful and a good addition to any team after you get the hang of her abilities. 
which should come fairly with ease the more you play with her, the more consistent you'll become. Uh, second, it sounds like everyone wants to play Diva. If sorry, so if I join a game and someone already chose her, can I also be Diva or do I have to play another character? If you do happen to join a game where another teammate picks Diva, yes, you'll have to choose another hero, as there's a one hero limit per team. This goes for all game modes apart from arcade mode, no limits, which, which is self-explanatory. I'll put that down there so I don't get muddled up. Number three. If I have to play someone else, who does Ava recommend? If you're just starting out in Overwatch, my best advice would be to use the one star difficulty heroes first, as they are the easiest to use and have, and have fairly simple kits to help you get used to the game mechanics. The heroes I personally found the easiest to pick up include Soldier 76, an offence hero, your generic military soldier shooter style character. This is the hero you learn in the tutorial of Overwatch. Mercy, a support hero whose job is to heal and watch over teammates. And Reinhardt, another tank hero who, like D.Va, is good for pretty much any team composition, but is styled more for protecting teammates with his shield. The reason I found these heroes easiest to play when I was beginning is because their jobs are very forward and simple. Uh, straightforward and simple and they are mainly assigned one role whether it's to attack, heal or protect. Number four. <clears throat> uh, a friend of mine just started playing Star Wars Battlefront and he gave up because the only people still playing the first game are experts now is Overwatch similar. It's never too late to get into Overwatch I'd say as I myself got into it a year after its initial release. Now in fact would be an ideal time to join the community as right now until the 27th of March the game is on sale and there was recently a free weekend bringing lots of newcomers and players to the game. And finally, for Ava, what's her opinion of the microtransactions in Overwatch because most people say the game got it right. she's written, I don't know what... Uh, right, okay, I'll just read out what she's got here, if she's actually written quite a bit more here. Most experts play... Uh, most experts in Overwatch play competitive mode, which, as implied, is taken a lot more seriously, and your job is to climb up the ranks. I, being in Diamond Rank, have had not much interest in competitive mode, and I much prefer the game's alternate mode, Quick Play, which is normal, non-competitive matches, where it's all just for fun and levelling your account up. The cosmetic items in Overwatch come from loot boxes, which can be earned once each time you level up, or can be bought with real money. The cosmetic items you receive include different skins, outfits for your characters, highlight intros, which play when you receive play of the game, victory poses, voice lines for your character, emotes for your character, and sprays, which can be placed around during matches. You can also collect in-game currency, which can only be received through loot boxes. You can buy cosmetics with these coins instead of hoping to receive them in a loot box by chance. Every two months, Overwatch hosts a seasonal event, a period of the time where a game is all altered to a decided theme, Halloween, Christmas, Summer Games and so on. With these events bring lots of exclusive and limited time only cosmetics which can be obtained just like the other ones. When an event comes is the only, sorry, when an event comes is the only time if ever I would recommend buying loot boxes as the rest of the game's normal items can easily be obtained by levelling up with no time limit on them. In a loot box you receive four items. What you receive is all completely random though. There's four rarity levels. Common is grey. Blue is rare, epic is purple, and legendary is gold yellow. The chances of getting these are as follows. You are guaranteed to receive at least one rare common item in every loot, every loot box. For epic, you have an 18.9% chance for every one you open. That's around one epic per five and a half boxes. I don't know where she got this information from. She did tell me she 
this I'm actually quite impressed with what she's done here because she's written she's written all this off her own back. She didn't copy this at all. She said she just she made it up. So I'm I'm actually quite impressed at how she's done. At least I know she's good at English. As for legendary, the chance of getting one is seven point four percent, around one legendary per thirteen and a half loot boxes. As I previously mentioned, these can also be purchased with in-game currency. Common is 25 coins, Rare is 75 coins, Epic 250 coins, Legendary 1000 coins. However, during an event, the price of the event exclusive cosmetics will be three times the price of a normal cosmetic. What the hell? Common is 75, Rare 225, Epic is 750, and Legendary is 3000 coins. My overall opinion of Overwatch is it's a very fun and addictive shooter. Yeah, I can vouch for that. That stands apart from your common military war style shooters. The variety of unique heroes is also a very strong factor of Overwatch as there are so many with lots of different kits to suit everyone's playstyle. And although I may be biased thinking D.Va is the best, the rest of the heroes are definitely worth trying out. It's a great game to play with friends and I think it's a very fun community to be part of. Thank you for asking me and I hope that what I've said hasn't been too confusing or unclear. I'm not a pro at the game, but I hope this is still useful to you. If you do decide to purchase Overwatch, then I hope you have fun playing just as much as I do, says Ava. So there you go, Kev, that is quite a, an extensive overview of Overwatch. Uh, maybe you can could tie up for a game some is it going to be on the PC or PS4 because uh, she plays it on the PC but I've also got on the PC and also the Xbox One so let me know so anyway if it's just yourself here Kev thanks for the questions buddy um, if anyone else is still with me thank you for watching thanks as always to all the stonking support you guys give me I mean I really do mean that sincerely uh, yeah that is it have a nice weekend guys and as always, thank you very much for watching.